Welcome to the Momxiety Club podcast. I'm your host, Tori Levine. Momxiety is a real thing for every new parent. And when you add in a chronic illness, food allergy, or other challenging circumstances, it can become downright isolating. And that's why the Momxiety Club is here for you. Each week, we'll discuss all things motherhood. So join me and let's get rid of this Momxiety together. Hello, I am so excited. It has been a big week. Uh, Last Wednesday, I shared my son got to get his first vaccine. So that was very exciting and a big step forward uh, for us. And kind of, I'm not feeling really much of the relief yet, but you know, I can tell that there's some sense of at least a little relief coming because he will be fully vaccinated and then we just have to wait for the two to five-year-old age range approvals. Um, But that's just some of the fun news. Uh, Today on the podcast, you get to meet the PD pals, Dr. Sammy and Dr. Anna. And they started, they met in their residency. And then in 2019, they launched their new company, the PD Pals. And with the aim of educating parents about common pediatric questions, ailments, and recommendations, and to discuss issues that require attention, but may not be able to be addressed in routine pediatric checkups. They are there to be your trusted source on source on social media at PD Pals, as well as they have an excellent podcast called the Well Child Podcast. And I was on that a few weeks ago. So I'm excited to share my interview with them. We talk about a lot of things about anxiety and momsiety. So I just want to remind you as well that this interview will be a good resource, but if you're still searching for that community of other moms who feel the same way, who get it, who just want to talk a little bit um, and have a place to relieve that anxiety through support groups online as well as a community, check out the Momxiety Club at join.momxietyclub.com. You also get to hear Dr. Sammy's hilarious way of moving, which It's genius, in fact, and I feel like I need to start doing it, and hopefully stay tuned on social media. You might see some funny reels there or videos of myself as well as Dr. Sammy uh, doing this or and Dr. Anna if she wants to join in. We talk about a lot. I know in the past I have shared that I was always, always concerned about being labeled the anxious new mom um, and just in general, the anxious mom at the doctor's office because I was worried all these different things were happening or, you know, they didn't know why I was calling all the time if I had questions. Um, But you'll get to hear the pediatrician's side of this. And spoiler alert, they do not care. They're not judging. And they're here to answer our questions. Right. Without any further ado, here are Dr. Sammy and Dr. Anna, the PD pals. Welcome, Dr. Anna and Dr. Sammy. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. We're so excited to have a good chat with you. Yes, I am very excited. I love uh, what you guys are doing your platform and sharing your knowledge and just all the goodness with parents out there in the world. So thank you for that. And I can't wait for Momsiety Club listeners to hear as well. So Dr. Anna or Dr. Sammy, you know, this is about momsiety. Every parent has anxiety, (laughs) mom, dadsiety, whatever you want to call it. And especially as a first time brand new parent, there's just everything like, is the swaddle blanket going to go over their face? You know, are they going to roll over at night? Am I feeding them the right things? Is this going to lead to this? Blah, blah, blah. (laughs) You know, tell us, you know, from your experience as pediatricians, what the most common things people come to you for are anxiety wise. And if it's necessary, 
for them to be worried about those things. Okay, I guess I'll take this one. <laughs> so, so first of all, before we start talking about all the, the struggles of parenthood and motherhood, I think it's really important for everyone to kind of find the provider that, you know, that they really connect with and that they trust. I think that's the biggest thing. You want to be able to trust your pediatrician. And, and sometimes that, um, that trust takes time to build. So it's okay if you don't know them off the bat, you know, but a lot of times we'll get moms and dads that will come in and talk to us before they deliver, or sometimes in the first few visits, it's really important. I think to get that connection of, um, things that you worry about as a parent to talk to your pediatrician, to kind of get an idea of what their philosophies are, what their practice styles are, and to not be afraid to ask questions. You know, that's the one thing that all us pediatricians have in common. I think we're pretty, um, you know, we're not very, uh, um, uh, you know, stress inducing. I hope not. We're usually very welcoming and we understand the plight of all parents. You know, we see it every day. You know, I see about 30 patients a, a day and I, every mom, um, you know, we understand that they're coming from a place of love and that anxiety is coming from just the the need to take care of their baby the best way that they can. And that's why we all went into pediatrics is because we know that that genuine care and that anxiety comes from a place of care. So first and foremost, I think it's important to talk to your pediatrician and, and, and establish that rapport with them and not be afraid to ask questions. Um, and we get parents that worry about things from you know, newborn phase to teenage years, you know, the minute you have a baby, you're going to be having questions, you're going to think you're going to have new things to worry about every day. So the, the key is, is establishing a good relationship and then talking to your pediatrician. That's number one. I can say starting from the newborn uh, period, when you first come home with your baby, you know, there's a few things that uh, a lot of parents worry about. One is gas, uh, a lot of gas, some fussy babies, some colicky babies. A lot of times we tell them over and over again, we're happy to do it, that gas and, and, and those kind of fussy babies, they're, it's normal. Their gut is growing. They're growing at a really rapid rate. It's normal for them to sneeze and burp and have a lot of gas. That's all normal. It means that they're healthy. So, you know, and we re reassure them, you know, things that, that are warning signs or things we tell them that you should worry about is of course, if your child is not feeding, you definitely wanna to talk to your pediatrician. If your newborn under the age of two months has a fever, you know, then you definitely want to get help immediately. Um, if they're vomiting and they're not able to keep down their feeds, you know, uh, not just spit up here, spit up there, but consistently vomiting. These are some of the things that we talk about. And at each stage, there's different concerns. So, you know, at the newborn period, the two week, the two months, the four months, we talk about all of these. So um, that's my little intro. I know. <laughs> we could talk about this uh, for hours, but I'll let Sammy chime in. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously she's super right about all of it. Um, when you were first asking the question and you were talking about swaddling and stuff, what was going through my head is, oh man, we sure do expect a lot of parents, don't we? Like mm -hmm. there's so much to know and we just expect everyone to know. And guess what? There's, it's true. Like from swaddling to what temperature your house should be at, to how to put a baby in a car seat, to how to feed a baby, to how to keep a baby alive. But, but it's even more minutia than that. You know, there's a right and wrong way to do everything, like how to put them to sleep and how not to, and how to keep them safe. And it's just so much. And, and they're not in the baby books. Um, it's just not what you would see from, from a, like a book you read or a course you took. Or if I can interrupt for one second, that you had the time to read those baby books. Right, exactly. And so it's so much to ask of people. And I mean, that's part of the reason why Anna and I do this social media presence, because even as a pediatrician, when you were talking, I was thinking, well, how am I going to tell them about all this, even me? Like, I'm, I'm just one person and we only have like 15 minutes in a checkup. Like, how can I tell them everything they need to know? And so we did try that venture to go online and inform parents as much as possible. But the bottom line, like take home message, it's like that really viral sound that went around, you know, that went like, are we supposed to know what we're doing? No, okay, you're not. Nobody is expecting anyone to know what they're doing because not only 
is it impossible to know what you're doing before the baby comes, but you don't even know what baby you're getting. <laughs> you don't even know who you're about to meet and what they're going to be like, whether they're going to have medical complications or not, how your delivery is going to go. You don't know anything. So there's really no way to prepare. It is totally trial by fire, totally just let's see how this goes and let's learn as we go along. And, um, and it's okay to make mistakes. And so I, I think that that's like a really important thing for parents to know that we, there's no way that we expect parents to come in and know exactly what they're doing. I've said this a million times. I'm happy to say it again. I was a doctor when I had my first child. I was a pediatrician when I had my first child. And I was every day like, what's that? What is this? What's that noise? Why is she doing that? I mean, I had no clue. And I kept saying, someday I'm going to write a book about this because I know what told me this, you know, even as all, with all the medical knowledge and the practice that I had, it's a totally different thing from bringing a baby home and then learning to get to know them. So um, it's okay to ask anything, honestly. And, it, and there are some things that you'll accidentally do wrong, but it's going to be okay. Like chances are it's going to be fine. And we tell you most of the important stuff at checkups. And most parents, thankfully, nowadays are educating themselves online by, you know, following, make sure to follow the right people. And um, if, you're, if you're on social media and stuff, because you'll get a lot of tidbits that way too. Yes. And that's, I do. Again, I'm just going to reiterate. That's why I love your, uh, not channel, your, what are you? Platform. <laughs> platform. <laughs> well, platform, yeah. I'm just thinking about even just on Instagram, your <laughs> handle. <laughs> like blank. Your account, your account, your Instagram. Yes, Dr. Anna. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> your account, because of all the great information that is provided. Oh, my God. Goodness gracious. <laughs> um, sorry, Dr. Anna, were you going to add on after that? I didn't want to cut you off. Oh, no, I was just, I, I was just going to say that in our little 15 minutes, we are trying to get the most important information across. So when we kind of graze over things or we're like, oh, you know, that's okay. It's not that we don't sympathize with the concern. A lot of times we're just trying to pack in, you know, the most important stuff, the vital stuff, you know, and it's definitely normal for moms to be worried about all these other things that, you know, we don't always have exact answers to, you know, we went through multiple years of training and residency to kind of, you know, be able to distinguish what's an emergency versus what's not. So a lot of times we're thinking in that doctor mode, you know, and I think it, it's good. It's helpful for your listeners to know that if your doctor isn't really concerned about one little thing, that's a good sign. I would take it and run, you know, I wouldn't, if, if it's, if it's something that's really important that they're worried about, they will let you know. And so that can reduce a lot of anxiety to say, okay, I might not have these answers about what the exact temperature or what the exact, you know, formula, or, you know, we might not have all the answers, but it's okay. It's, it, you know, it's okay to not know sometimes either, you know, and those things are probably not the most urgent. So. And bring a list. You'll think yeah. of stuff when you leave. We love lists. You know, moms will show up the next checkup and they've accumulated 12 questions over the last few weeks. <laughs> We're happy to answer all of them. Or dads come and then they say, well, I'm, mom's going to call you back next time because I forgot the list. <laughs> so <laughs> it's totally all okay. That's great. I did. I had like a little app that we used went for with my first, that was seven years ago. Um, yes. And now there's been so many technological advances since then <laughs> to always have the list with us. So, well, I love how you mentioned, did you, could I ask a personal question, Dr. Sammy, since you mentioned about being a mom or being a doctor when you first became a mom, did that then change you as a doctor? Oh yeah. I love this question. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. So real quick, um, I actually originally was going to be a pediatric hematologist oncologist, which is a pediatric cancer doctor. That was my journey forever. That's what I, well, not forever, but you know, for a while, for years before, that's what I was planning to do. And then I had my first daughter in my first year of residency. And that's usually around the time where you start to go into interviews in the middle of your first year for what would be happening after residency when you're specializing. And um, I, I remember just the, 
the, the huge change in myself that happened after I had my first daughter. I was not the same person I was before. I had completely different understanding. I don't ever say just anymore. Like I used to say just a lot, like, oh, it's just colic. Well, it's not just colic, colic stinks and it's a big deal. And, but I, um, I would say it's just colic before I was a mom because I meant it in like a, you know, calming and kind of reassuring way. But then when you're the, on the recipient and you're the mother and you're going through it, you're like, we mean just call it like this is ruining my life, you know? So I, I did change a lot of that kind of stuff because that I viewed things differently. But also I was halfway through my interviews to be a pediatric oncologist and um, I, I aborted mission halfway through. I was like, oh, wow. So I'm either going to be a very terrible pediatric oncologist or I'm going to be a terrible mom. It's going to be one of the two because I'm going to think she has cancer all the time. And that's not everybody. You know, there are a lot of pediatric oncologists that are amazing and they can compartmentalize beautifully, but I, I'm not one of them. And I, I realized that how it, it was like a, you know, you, you were telling us before about kind of an epiphany that you had. That was my moment. It was in the middle of an interview. They were asking me a question and it just kind of like came over me. And then I didn't want to talk to them anymore. Yeah. I was like, I need to go. I need to like figure my life out. Hold on a second. But I couldn't obviously. So I had to like fake it through the rest of the interview. And then I, I went home and I told my husband and I said, you know what? I can't go forward with this because I'm always going to think that she has something terrible and I'm not going to be able to be good at both things. And I can't do that. I can't not be good at both things. I have to be a good doctor and I have to be a great mom. So I need to just stay where I am. And so that's a long kind of story for you, but just to let you know that it absolutely changed me as the type of pediatrician I was even before I had her. And after I had her, my sympathy level went through the roof. Um, my, you know, I, I feel like, like the universe has humbled me. I mean, it's like every time I'm like, eh, earwax, no biggie. And then my kids will end up having like this crap ton of earwax that I like is so terrible to get out. And I'm like, okay, so now I get what parents are going through with the whole earwax thing, you know? And so the universe has always had a good, like, oh, okay, so you think stomach aches are no big deal. Here we go. Here's a kid with a stomach ache. And suddenly you're like, oh God. And so I, I think that my, my sympathy and my empathy levels have increased tremendously since being a mom. And I feel like I have lived very, so many of the things that my patients have lived. So I, I really like, I get, I get it. <laughs> yeah. And I have all the same mom questions as anyone else. And Anna is the person I go to. <laughs> so just like y'all come to us, um, pediatricians go to each other too. And just to ask the same, literally the same questions. We might ask it a little differently in the, I know it's probably not, X, Y, and Z, or I know what you're going to tell me, but I need to hear it anyway. Right. So actually based off of that, what would you recommend, how would you recommend that somebody ask you one of these questions that we found off of Dr. Google, or we had experience with from a older child, um, just in my personal experience, we have a lot of that. My oldest has very early onset inflammatory bowel disease. So everything starting at like two months, I was like, oh gosh, this. And whenever there's a slight, maybe stomach ache or uh, digestional <laughs> issues, I'll say it's like red alert, everything. Um, so how, if somebody was coming to you, Dr. Anna, what would you, how would you want them to ask in a way that is not like, I know this is it because my other kid had this or my best friend's kid has this and this is exactly what's going on. Yeah, you know, I think when parents come with any kind of concern, um, it's always important to validate their concern because they're coming from a place of mommy instinct, you know, mommy gut is a real thing. It's important. And we cannot, we don't live with your child. You know, we are not with your child um, every day. You know, I kind of had, when you guys were talking about the, having the mommy experience, you know, I don't, I don't have children yet, but I come from that opposite angle of like, I don't know what you're going through. So I have a lot of sympathy because I haven't lived it personally, you know? And so I kind of come from that place when I'm approaching it. I'm like, listen, if you're concerned, that means I'm concerned. So no concern is 
not valid. And if you're going to go on Google, you know, that is a source. Now we have a worldwide community and we have a lot of information out there. So I'm never going to discourage people to not look at resources, to go and find information, but it all has to be done responsibly. You know, that's going to be the biggest thing. So if parents are reading information out there about their child's symptoms and they're putting it on Google, you know, I want them to share that with me and I want them to talk about and us to talk about it so that I can rest, I can put some of their concerns to rest and address the other ones. And so transparency is going to be the most important. Validating, you know, concerns are going to be the way I approach it. And then I usually tell moms that, you know, no two kids are the same. And anybody that has two children or more will tell you that. They don't follow the rule books. <laughs> they all do things differently. And one formula that you try to reapply on your other one never works. <laughs> and so just as an observer, I, we can tell you that that is the story of every household, you know? So it's, it's natural for you to go through an experience and then use that same experience on your next child. That's very natural. And it's okay for moms to do that. But let us kind of sort through that information for you. So when they come up, you know, with GI symptoms, there's, there's specific things. And we go through training for this to figure out which symptoms and signs are concerning and which ones we're okay with. And, you know, we, we have to look at the whole picture. And when it comes to reading like research and, and, and studies online, I always encourage parents to bring me their sources. And to, and to let's have a discussion about it because there might be a new study that I haven't you know, seen or read. Um, we do a lot of research. We, we um, keep reading. Every day we're learning more things because there's more and more research done. So we are always willing to continue to add to our wheelhouse. You know, um, So I think that's the biggest thing. Don't be afraid to trust your mommy gut. Come with all your questions. Bring your sources and let's talk about it with a professional that's been trained to do it. I'll also say from, I totally agree with everything Anna said. I'll also say from the mom angle again, that um, be, be careful when you Google, we're totally okay with it. Um, because again, times have changed. And um, there's a lot of times where actually there are so many times when somebody will have seen something on the internet. And I'll, I'll honestly say, you know what, I didn't even think of that, but I'm happy to look into it for you. So it's great. Like it's a team effort here. And as Anna so eloquently said, like, you know, your kiddo best. So we're, it's not like an insult to us or anything, but from the mom angle, I don't Google and I mean, I don't use Google, but I don't look into when my kids have something, like if my child complains of a headache, for example, I purposely don't do it because if I do, the first thing that's going to pop up is brain tumor. And then I won't be able to sleep. I mean, it's like over for me, you know, I, I can't get it out of my head. It's like a, a continuous loop of, but what if it is a bridge? Of, but if it is, a bridge of, blah, blah, blah. and, and so that's why I do like, I have, I'm so lucky. I work with two of my best friends who happen to be pediatricians. So I literally will say, look, like she's having headaches at you figure out if it's something like a brain tumor or not. Like, I don't want that responsibility myself because I know what it will do to me. And that's just, again, my personality. But you need to, and this is where it's so important, like you really need to trust your pediatrician. Know that there's a very small chance that they might make a mistake. We're human, it happens. But if you are feeling like this person it has my child and my family's best interest at heart and that you feel confident in their abilities, I think that's huge uh, when it comes to the discussion that's being had. So it's so much easier of a discussion if I say like, I know as a pediatrician, if I, if I say like, for example, I know it's not inflammatory bowel disease because X, Y, and Z. And then they'll say, um, you know what though? I'm still worried about it. And I'm like, okay, let's test it. You know what is a poop test I can do? It's something called a calprotectin, like no biggie, you know, let's do it. It's not, it's not an invasive thing you're asking me. So let's screen for it. Um, and then will you feel better? Like, will you be able to sleep better at night? And 99% of the times people say, yeah, they, they can. So that would be the only thing I would caution with Google is that it can like kind of get in your head a little bit. And we all know the dangers of like WebMD. It always gives you the worst case scenario right up. But, and actually 99% of the time, it's not the worst case scenario. It's actually the nothing scenario. <laughs> the one on page like 20 down there somewhere that you never get to. I, I wrote down, because I loved what you said, Dr. Anna, um, 
to bring the research and have an open and honest conversation. Um, that just sends me down uh, memory lane because as with our son, with our oldest, my husband would read all these articles and it, research studies to talk about with the doctors. But also, I love that you're, you're telling us not to be ashamed of doing that. And that kind of leads me to the next thing that I wanted to ask about is, you know, we label ourselves as moms or worry that pediatricians or others are going to label us as the anxious new mom. Oh, she's just that, you know, it's fine. Um, and sometimes people don't call or kind of some of the things that you talked about earlier with trusting your pediatrician. And, you know, if things continue going back to the pediatrician, you know, if they say, it's okay, relax for a little bit, but if you find something later, you can take it back to them. That is so important, by the way, Tori. That's so important that I, I hope that every person listening to this podcast knows um, a lot of times we make the assumption, and it's not a correct assumption as pediatricians, but it needs to be said, we make the assumption that if things don't get better, you'll come back. Please come back. If you are told to go home and sit on it or hang tight or that it's normal, and then you do, and then you're still like, mm, nothing's changed, this is not good, or things are better, it's still affecting his life or her life, and blah, 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 come on back. We need to know if it's not getting better, actually. And so that's a really good point, actually. Yeah, and a part of what we do is, is something called anticipatory guidance, because kids change minute by minute, day by day, they change. And so if at that moment, if there's something you were concerned about and the doctor reassures you saying right now, this looks okay, you always want to ask if your doctor hasn't already told you, because they most likely will say, if this, this, and this happens, or if it's not better by this time, why don't you come back? And so a lot of times, if your doctor didn't have time to tell you that, it's always good for parents to ask saying, I love it when moms ask me, you know, when should I come back? When should I be worried if this fever is not gone or if this diarrhea is not gone? You know, it's okay to ask those questions because it gives you a timeline. It takes the burden off of your shoulders to kind of decide and you get like exact guidelines of when you should come back and ask, you know, ask those questions. And so you're never wrong to do that. I just wanted to add that. And it helps your anxiety so much because like Sammy was saying, when it's coming to your loved ones, you cannot think, you know, whether you're a doctor or you're a pediatrician or you're, you know, a mom, you cannot think when it comes to your child. So, and you don't want to be the one making those decisions. And so that's why it's important to have that trust and to say, Hey, I've recognized these things. And now I need your help. You know, um, it's it really important. big discussion. Like it's everyone is involved. Everyone's important. And if there's something that's being done that you're not okay with, like that's, that's what the whole process is. I don't ever want anyone to feel bad for asking questions or feeling like we're going to be labeling them as that mom or that family. I don't ever want that because I, I want people to know we don't look at people that way. When we have our doctor hat on, like we're not in a, we're not sitting in a judgment seat. We're just completely there only to help. That is our only mission. I mean, literally every medical school interview, why do you want to do this? I want to help people. So that's how it, it is. We just want to help you out. So we are not looking at you like, oh, I can't believe she asked me this question, or I can't believe she's here again, or I can't. It's not like that at all. If anything, we would so much rather you come to us if you feel like something's not right or, you know, and everyone has different levels of need. You know, some people really do need their hands held through every day, for example, of an illness. You know, I might say like, okay, your baby's three months old. They have RSV. Things are going to get worse before they get better. And they're like, I don't want to be at home for this. You know, what do I do? Well, come on back tomorrow and I'll tell you what to do and come on back the next day and I'll, I'll walk you through the whole thing, you know, until they're all better. 
that's okay. And then there's some kids that I'm like, I haven't seen you in forever. Where have you been? You know? And so it's, we see it all and it's totally okay. So I don't want anyone to think that we're looking at them or we're judging them or we're labeling them as parents. Cause we really, we really don't. We see every type of person and family and we have seen all of it by now. So nothing surprises us. So just be yourself, really just be yourself. (laughs) And we joke about this also, because sometimes we'll see like our personalities are different. So we'll see patients with certain personalities veer to different doctors and that's okay too. We laugh about it, but there's, you know, me as a patient, when I go to my doctor, I kind of want more information than less information. You know, I'm like, I want to know the details just because that's how my mind works. And so I, that helps me reduce my anxiety. There's some patients and moms that come and they're like, listen, I don't want too much information. I need you to tell me the breakdown. You know, I need you to tell me, is this okay? Is this not okay? You know? And because if I keep blabbing and telling them all the things and all the possibilities, they're like, no, this is increasing my anxiety. Mm -hmm. So understanding personalities, understanding how people, um, you know, take information, process it. That's That's part of Yeah. yeah, it's part of our job. It's what we do. And if you feel like your pediatrician is not understanding kind of the way you need that information, then it's, it, we don't take it personally, you know, find someone that understands your love language or your, your, you know, your understanding <laughs> language, because it's different. We're all having different personalities, but I know now, as I've learned my patients, like this person needs this, you know, and this person needs the hand holding and needs me to give them all the information up front. So um, it's okay, regardless of the personality you are. <laughs> Well, thank you. You both summarized that and gave the most reassuring answers because I, I would never think to ask that to my children's pediatrician. Like, are you labeled? Like, am I asking too many questions? Like, am I annoying you? You know, at what point am I going to get to that? So both of your answers. Thank you. If not for everybody else who's listening, which I'm sure it will be reassuring for them too, but for me. (laughs) thank you for being there to help and not judge um well I would love to ask you both since we I want to respect your time about self-care and I'm a big proponent of realistic self-care so doing something little every day who would like to start I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on you Dr. Dr. Anna? No, I mean, that's a great question. I think self-care needs to be uh, on everyone's radar. Um, We always say that you cannot, um, you have to fill your own cup before you can fill anyone else's. And so you do have to take care of yourself in whatever capacity you can, you know? Um, And and I think it's, it's important to be realistic. Like you said, I really resonate with that because everyone can just do what they can. And so uh, if you're going to say, okay, I'm going to need to take a whole weekend out for self-care, that might not be reasonable for some people that have multiple jobs that are supporting, you know, multiple children, grandparents, all of that. So everyone has to look at their individual circumstance and then figure out where they can take those little breaks to to fill their cup. Um, You know, I I personally um, rely a lot on meditation. Um, It's something that I use and even, and it's something that I can do for five minutes or I can do for 30 minutes, you know? Um, And that's just, just stopping, just being with yourself, being present. As I started doing it more and more, I feel like it's the best kind of self-care. Just taking that minute to breathe and pause and, um, you know, having that time, it's almost addicting, you know, I've gotten addicted to it. And so I think just something as simple as shutting everything off for five minutes, just focusing on your breathing or listening to a podcast, uh, you know, or, or doing something that um, kind of helps rejuvenate you, helps inspire you, helps you know, uh, not only just physically, but also emotionally and mentally um, helps boost you. I think if, even if that's five minutes of, of on, on the exercise machine or doing something, uh, being outdoors, um, anything. So I'm a big proponent of realistic self-care. <laughs> 
Ah, uh, yeah. So the the lovely self care question. That's like, how do you do it, and then balance that with not having mom guilt, <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, obviously, Anna and I are friends, so our our answers are going to be very similar because, believe it or not, we've talked about this a whole lot. So my personal approach is, um, I like give myself a big break, as in I don't expect a, mir a miracle for myself. So what can I do is a big part of it. I love to take baths. So I do try to take a bath every day. And yes, my children try to sneak into my bathtub with me. That's normal. That's fine. And I don't mind anymore. They're a little older, so they are not like sucking my life away when they're in the bathtub. Um, so it's fine. Um, but the, another thing I do is like, I used to be like, okay, I have all these exercise aspirations, like bring on the beach body. No, 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 I can't, I can't. I mean, I actually get so much more stressed out if I try to. So right now my self-care for movement is that before I get in my car, when I hop on my way to work, I run around my car three times. <laughs> so, oh, I love it. That's my exercise. Now, if I happen to have time, like, you know, and on the weekend where I can be active, get on a bike, go out with Doris, my kids, run tennis, whatever, I will do it. But that's not an expectation. My only thing that I do is I'll just run around my car. It's so silly. My neighbors have all commented, like, why are you doing that? Why don't you just get in? And I'm like, <laughs> look, this might be the only exercise I get all day. Get off my back. <laughs> so, and every day I actually do the whole, okay, I only have like 30 minutes to get to work. Do I have time for three? Yes, I have time for running around my car for three times. So I have like the little internal monologue every day, uh, but it's little things like that. I also meditate like Anna, but I don't have time to meditate very much. So sometimes it's literally in between patients. I'll be at my desk for like one second and I'll take a few deep breaths and then I go on. So it's really just checking in with yourself. Um, and the, by the way, the whole car running thing, it's usually like I'm taking my kids to work and then going to school, I'm sorry, to school and then going to work. And so they will run around with me. So I don't know if I've taught them a life skill with this or what, but they think it's the funnest thing ever. <laughs> um, I have a special request. I really would, can you please do a video of this and post it? on social media so that this can go out then with when the episode goes out I can <laughs> of our self-care or of me running around my car <laughs> of you doing your self-care that is running around your car I don't know why we haven't thought of this as a real idea before <laughs> yeah this is it and now like I want the, we can do like the PD pals mom's diety club like whatever hashtag yeah i love it sure. our self-care <laughs> challenge <laughs> and we'll all post them so perfect i love it well thank you both so much how can listeners find you get in touch with you um and you're in houston so if anybody's in the houston area to come see you Yes, you can find us everywhere. We're all over the place. <laughs> we're, we're, on, we're on all the social media platforms. So we're on Instagram, we're on TikTok, we're on uh, Facebook, we're on Twitter, and it's at the PD Pals. Um, and that's our, that's our handle through all of it. We also have a podcast, it's called The Well Child. And we have the wonderful Miss Tori on, and we have wonderful guests, and we talk about all kinds of things from uh, mom life to, you know, just very specific things uh, about everything, pediatrics. And we're also on YouTube. Um, so we have our podcast there as well. And uh, also on any platform that you can find. We also have a website. It's called <laughs> pdpals.com. And we have great resources for parents on there. We have a blog. Okay. Did I miss anything, Sammy? No, I know. You're right. We are literally everywhere. So it's the P-H-E-P-D-P-E-D-I -E -E PALS, P-A-L-S. PD obviously stands for pediatric. So you can go to the pedipals.com or at the pedipals on every platform and you will see our faces. <laughs> and those, I will share links. Those links are in the show notes. Great. So if you're not able to get it right away, just head back to the show notes. So Awesome. Well, thank, thank you. you, Dr. Anna. Thank you, Dr. Sammy. It has been so wonderful talking to you. I now have 20 million other things I would love to bring you back for. So I hope we will get to chat again on a future episode. We would love thank that. Thanks so for much. having us, Marie. Thank you. You are not the only one with mom's anxiety. You are not alone. No matter how alone in your worries you may feel. 
I'm here too. I've been there too. Reach out via email or on social media. Reach out to a friend who has a child who may be facing other challenges. Share that you have mom anxiety too, and just know that you are not the only one. I am here to support you. And the more we normalize and talk about these feelings, the easier it gets. For more information about working with Tori or joining the Mom Anxiety Club, head to join.momsietyclub.com. There, you'll find information about Sneeze Proof Your Pelvic Floor course, as well as the Mom Anxiety Club, where you'll get access to two monthly support groups with other moms just like you, as well as exercises and a chat about the monthly theme to help manage your mom anxiety. The Mom Anxiety Club podcast is not intended to take place of medical advice or therapy. If you are in crisis, call your local emergency number or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK.